Chapter 25 Shall We Consult Spiritualist Physicians? Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria, and was sick. And he sent messengers, and said unto them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. This narrative most strikingly displays the divine displeasure against those who turn from God to satanic agencies. A short time previous to the events above recorded, the kingdom of Israel had changed rulers. Ahab had fallen under the judgment of God and had been succeeded by his son Ahaziah, a worthless character who did only evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father and mother and causing Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger just as his father Ahab had done. But judgments followed close upon the sins of the rebellious king, a war with Moab, and then the accident by which his own life was threatened attested the wrath of God against Ahaziah. How much had the king of Israel heard and seen in his father's time of the wondrous works of the Most High! What terrible evidence of his severity and jealousy had God given apostate Israel! Of all this, Ahaziah was cognizant. Yet he acted as though these awful realities and even the fearful end of his own father were only an idle tale. Instead of humbling his heart before the Lord, he ventured upon the most daring act of impiety which marked his life. He commanded his servants, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease." The idol of Ekron was supposed to give information through the medium of its priests concerning future events. It had obtained such general credence that it was resorted to by large numbers from a considerable distance. The predictions there uttered and the information given proceeded directly from the Prince of Darkness. It is Satan who created and who maintains the worship of idols, to divert the minds of men from God. It is by his agency that the kingdom of darkness and falsehood is supported. The history of King Ahaziah's sin and punishment has a lesson of warning which none can disregard with impunity. Though we do not pay homage to heathen gods, yet thousands are worshipping at Satan's shrine as verily as did the king of Israel. The very spirit of heathen idolatry is rife today, though under the influence of science and education it has assumed a more refined and attractive form. Every day adds sorrowful evidence that faith in the sure word of prophecy is fast decreasing, and that in its stead superstition and satanic witchery are captivating the minds of men. All who do not earnestly search the scriptures and submit every desire and purpose of life to that unerring test, all who do not seek God in prayer for a knowledge of His will, will surely wander from the right path and follow under the deception of Satan. The heathen oracles have their counterpart in the spiritualistic mediums, their clairvoyants and fortune-tellers of today. The mystic voices that spoke at Ekron and Endor are still by their lying words misleading the children of men. The Prince of Darkness has but appeared under a new guise. The mysteries of heathen worship are replaced by the secret associations and seances, 
the obscurities and wonders of the sorcerers of our time. Their disclosures are eagerly received by thousands who refuse to accept light from God's word or from his spirit, while they speak with scorn of the magicians of old, the great deceiver laughs in triumph as they yield to his arts under a different form. His agents still claim to cure disease. They attribute their power to electricity, magnetism, or the so-called sympathetic remedies. In truth, they are but channels for Satan's electric currents, by this means, he casts his spell over the bodies and souls of men. I have, from time to time, received letters both from ministers and lay members of the church inquiring if I think it is wrong to consult spiritualist and clairvoyant physicians. I have not answered these letters for want of time, but just now the subject is again urged upon my attention. So numerous are these agents of Satan becoming, and so general is the practice of seeking counsel from them, that it seems needful to utter words of warning. God has placed it in our power to obtain a knowledge of the laws of health. He has made it our duty to preserve our physical powers in the best possible condition that we may render to him acceptable service. Those who refuse to improve the light and knowledge that has been mercifully placed within their reach are rejecting one of the means which God has granted them to promote spiritual as well as physical life. They are placing themselves where they will be exposed to the delusions of Satan. Not a few in this Christian age and Christian nation resort to evil spirits rather than trust to the power of the living God. The mother watching by the sickbed of her child, exclaims, I can do no more. Is there no physician who has power to restore my child? She is told of the wonderful cures performed by some clairvoyant or magnetic healer, and she trusts her dear one to his charge, placing it as verily in the hands of Satan as if he were standing by her side. In many instances, the future life of the child is controlled by a satanic power which it seems impossible to break. Many are unwilling to put forth the needed effort to obtain a knowledge of the laws of life and the simple means to be employed for the restoration of health. They do not place themselves in right relation to life. When sickness is a result of their transgression of natural law, they do not seek to correct their errors and then ask the blessing of God, but they resort to the physicians. If they recover health, they give to drugs and doctors all the honor. If they are ever ready to idolize human power and wisdom, seeming to know no other god than the creature, dust and ashes. I have heard a mother pleading with some infidel physician to save the life of her child. But when I entreated her to seek help from the great physician who is able to save to the utmost all who come unto him in faith, she turned away with impatience. Here we see the same spirit that was manifested by Ahaziah. It is not safe to trust to physicians who have not the fear of God before them. Without the influence of divine grace, the hearts of men are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Self-aggrandizement is their aim. Under the cover of the medical profession, what iniquities have been concealed? What delusions supported? The physician may claim to possess great wisdom and marvelous skill when his character is abandoned and his practice contrary to the laws of life. The Lord our God assures us that he is waiting to be gracious. He invites us to call upon him in the day of trouble. How can we turn from him to trust in an arm of flesh? Go with me to yonder sick room. There lies a husband and father, 
a man who is a blessing to society and to the cause of God. He has been suddenly stricken down by disease. The fire of fever seems consuming him. He longs for pure water to moisten the parched lips, to quench the raging thirst and cool the fevered brow. But no, the doctor has forbidden water. The stimulus of strong drink is given and adds fuel to the fire. The blessed heaven-sent water, skillfully applied, would quench the devouring flame, but it is set aside for poisonous drugs. For a time nature wrestles for her rights, but at last overcome, she gives up the contest and death sets the sufferer free. God desired that man to live, to be a blessing to the world. Satan determined to destroy him, and through the agency of the physician he succeeded. How long shall we permit our most precious lights to be thus extinguished? Ahaziah sent his servants to inquire of Beelzebub at Ekron, but instead of a message from the idol, he heard the awful denunciation from the God of Israel, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. It was Christ that bade Elijah speak these words to the apostate king. Jehovah Emmanuel had cause to be greatly displeased at Ahaziah's impiety. What had Christ not done to win the hearts of sinners and to inspire them with unwavering confidence in himself? For ages he had visited his people with manifestations of the most condescending kindness and unexampled love. From the times of the patriarchs he had shown how his delights were with the sons of men. He had been a very present help to all who sought in sincerity. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. Yet Israel had revolted from God and turned for help to the Lord's worst enemy. The Hebrews were the only nation favored with the knowledge of the true God. When the king of Israel sent to inquire of a pagan oracle, he proclaimed to the heathen that he had more confidence in their idols than in the God of his people, the creator of the heavens and the earth. In the same manner do those who profess to have a knowledge of God's word dishonor him when they turn from the source of strength and wisdom to ask help or counsel from the powers of darkness. If God's wrath was kindled by such a course on the part of a wicked, idolatrous king, how can he regard a similar course pursued by those who profess to be his servants? Why is it that men are so unwilling to trust him who created man, and who can by a touch, a word, a look, heal all manner of disease? Who is more worthy of our confidence than the one who made so great a sacrifice for our redemption? Our Lord has given us definite instruction through the Apostle James as to our duty in case of sickness. When human help fails, God will be the helper of his people. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. If the professed followers of Christ would, with purity of heart, exercise as much faith in the promises of God as they repose in satanic agencies, they would realize in soul and body the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. God has granted to this people great light, Yet we are not placed beyond the reach of temptation. Who among us are seeking help from the gods of Ekron? Look on this picture, not drawn from imagination. In how many, even among Seventh-day Adventists, may its leading characteristics be seen? An invalid, 
apparently very conscientious, yet bigoted and self-sufficient, freely avows his contempt for the laws of health and life which divine mercy has led us as a people to accept. His food must be prepared in a manner to satisfy his morbid cravings. Rather than sit at a table where wholesome food is provided, he will patronize restaurants because he can there indulge appetite without restraint. A fluent advocate of temperance, he disregards its foundation principles. He wants relief, but refuses to obtain it at the price of self-denial. That man is worshiping at the shrine of perverted appetite. He is an idolater. The powers which sanctified and ennobled might be employed to honor God are weakened and rendered of little service. An irritable temper, a confused brain, and unstrung nerves are among the results of his disregard of nature's laws. He is inefficient, unreliable. Whoever has the courage and honesty to warn him of danger thereby incurs his displeasure. The slightest remonstrance or opposition is sufficient to rouse his combative spirit. But now an opportunity is presented to seek help from one whose power comes through the medium of witchcraft. To this source he applies with eagerness, freely expending time and money in hope of securing the proffered boon. He is deceived, infatuated. The sorcerer's power is made the theme of praise, and others are influenced to seek his aid. Thus the God of Israel is dishonored, while Satan's power is revered and exalted. In the name of Christ I would address his professed followers. Abide in the faith which you have received from the beginning. Shun profane and vain babblings. Instead of putting your trust in witchcraft, have faith in the living God. Cursed is the path that leads to Endor or to Ekron. The feet will stumble and fall that venture upon the forbidden ground. There is a God in Israel with whom is deliverance for all that are oppressed. Righteousness is the habitation of his throne. There is danger in departing in the least from the Lord's instruction. When we deviate from the plain path of duty, a train of circumstances will arise that seems irresistibly to draw us further and further from the right. Needless intimacies with those who have no respect for God will seduce us ere we are not aware. Fear to offend worldly friends will deter us from expressing our gratitude to God or acknowledging our dependence upon Him. We must keep close to the Word of God. We need its warnings and encouragement, its threatenings and promises. We need the perfect example given only in the life and character of our Savior. Angels of God will preserve His people while they walk in the path of duty, but there is no assurance of such protection for those who deliberately venture upon Satan's ground. An agent of the great deceiver will say and do anything to gain his object. It matters little whether he calls himself a spiritualist, an electric physician, or a magnetic healer. By specious pretenses, he wins the confidence of the unwary. He pretends to read the life history and to understand all the difficulties and afflictions of those who resort to him disguising himself as an angel of light. While the blackness of the pit is in his heart, he manifests great interest in women who seek his counsel. He tells them that all their troubles are due to an unhappy marriage. This may be too true, but such a counselor does not better their condition. He tells them that they need love and sympathy. Pretending great interest in their welfare, he casts a spell over his unsuspecting victims, charming them as the serpent charms the trembling bird. Soon they are completely in his power. Sin, disgrace, and ruin 
are the terrible sequel. These workers of iniquity are not few. Their path is marked by desolated homes, blasted reputations, and broken hearts. But of all this the world knows little. Still they go on making fresh victims, and Satan exults in the ruin he has wrought. The visible and the invisible world are in close contact. Could the veil be lifted, we would see evil angels pressing their darkness around us and working with all their power to deceive and destroy. Wicked men are surrounded, influenced, and aided by evil spirits. The man of faith and prayer has yielded his soul to divine guidance, and angels of God bring to him light and strength from heaven. No man can serve two masters. Light and darkness are no more opposites than the service of God and the service of Satan. The prophet Elijah presented the matter in the true light when he fearlessly appealed to apostate Israel, If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Those who give themselves up to the sorcery of Satan may boast of great benefit received thereby, but does this prove their course to be wise or safe? What if life should be prolonged? What if temporal gain should be secured? Will it pay in the end to disregard the will of God? All such apparent gain will prove at last an irrecoverable loss. We cannot with impunity break down a single barrier which God has erected to guard his people from Satan's power. Our only safety is in preserving the ancient landmarks to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them.